Hello, my name is Lisa Haywood. Um, I work at the Bureau of Wellness at the Department of Education. And today my session is best practices for engaging students in the online environment. Um, this session is focused primarily on um, middle school and high school students and teachers, but it can be applied in principle to lower levels. Um, if you use a learning management system such as Blackboard or Moodle or Canvas or Google Classroom, this session is really relevant to you and might be helpful. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and we'll start the PowerPoint. All right, engaging students online. My session overview, I'm going to start with a brief overview of the benefits of online learning. Then we'll talk about some research findings. Um, I've got five principles for engagement that you can apply in all of your lessons. I've got some assignment examples. And lastly, I can talk about some of the tools that you can use in a learning management system for your assignments. We'll close by looking towards the future a little bit. So let me start, as I start all my session, by talking about the benefits of online learning. Online learning isn't the best way for all students to learn. And likewise, it's not the best way for all teachers to teach but it works well for many, many students and it also works well for many, many teachers. The first time you teach online, it can be very bumpy, it can be time consuming and it can be stressful. But as you get more familiar with it and as you keep it simple, the more effective you're going to be and the more you actually might find that you enjoy it. Online learning creates a level playing field for most students. In a traditional classroom, I know you've all experienced, you have students who sit at the front of the room. They've got very strong social skills. They're very eager to interact openly with you and with fellow students. They think quickly, they can think on their feet. They don't at all mind being the center of attention. Those students are pretty easy to assess. You can have a very good idea quite quickly of how well they're meeting the learning outcomes or objectives for the course or the lesson. But then you've also going to have a group of students who are quieter. They might sit in the back of the room. They might be very shy. They might not like any attention. They might not raise their hand. They might be very reluctant to engage with you. <clears throat> excuse me, and with their fellow students. Though those students who it's more difficult to assess how well they're meeting the learning objectives during class. But in the online environment, where the pressures of social interaction and being the focus of attention are very much mitigated, every student has got the opportunity to really engage on a different level in asynchronous, in non-real time. And students who struggle in the classroom with um, <clears throat> being vocal and interacting often do very well online. Online um, learning gives students the time and the opportunity to review materials time and time again, and they can reflect on questions and prompts before they respond. So as a result, they feel a lot more self-confident. They don't feel they're put on the spot. They feel less stress. They feel less anxiety. And they can really be students at their best. Further, online learning supports the theories of circadian rhythms. For those of you, parents in the room, who have got adult or young adult or teenage children, you may have noticed they don't want to get up at six o'clock in the morning. They certainly don't want to be sitting in a math classroom at eight o'clock in the morning. And if they are, they're probably not going to be at their best as students. But move the day further in and at seven o'clock in the evening or at 10 o'clock in the evening, those students who struggle with the early morning hours to learn do very, very well in the evening. 
online learning reinforces writing skills. Online learning and teaching is writing it heavy, it's text heavy, it's very, um, very much focused on the skills of individual students and their writing abilities. On the positive side, um, students who love to write excel in the online environment, but students who are challenged with their writing actually are able to grow more because they're required to write more. Online learning allows for lots of creativity, as we'll see. And surprisingly enough, for many of you, it's not a flat um, learning experience. It provides lots of opportunity for engagement. So research about distance education has been happening for the last 20 years. And there has been a lot of studies about the science of online pedagogy and a lot of work and research on the psychology of online teaching and learning. And the walk away from most of these studies are, is that the more students engage in an online class, the more likely they're going to be to persist, complete, and meet the course outcomes or objectives. Just like in a traditional classroom, we know how students interact. We know there's student-teacher engagement and interaction, there is student-to-student -student engagement and interaction, and there is student-to-content engagement and interaction. And these three types of engagement and interaction are what you want to bring into the virtual classroom. And it's not difficult to do once you know basically what the principles are for doing it. So I've got five principles for effective um, engagement and interaction, and there are probably way more than five, but for, for today, we'll start with five. The first one, just like you do in the traditional classroom, is know your students. Um, you need to select activities and assignments and materials that are developmentally appropriate, challenging and interesting. So you do this every day, so you know what to do. Second of all, and this is where um, faculty are, and teachers are often surprised about online teaching, you want to come up with activities and assignments that trigger their emotions. So your assignments and your projects in the online world are going to stimulate the students rational thinking abilities as well as their emotions. So think about it in terms of two goals for every assignment, rational thinking, content, and the student emotion. Thirdly, determine completion time. Plan the amount of time that your students will need for each activity or assignment. You want to mitigate the chance of your students losing focus if an assignment is drawn out over too many weeks. But you also don't want the assignment to be so short that the student doesn't have enough time to do it. So the best practice is to keep your work within a weekly completion structure. So make sure that your students can complete your assignments within an academic week. And there are going to be exceptions to this and I will give you an example of one. Fourthly, establish clear guidelines for interaction. So make sure you've posted a netiquette in your online classroom. You can Google netiquette and come up with any number of developmentally appropriate netiquette clauses. But also make sure your assignment guidelines are really, really clear to the student. Um, in a traditional classroom, students who have questions about an assignment can raise their hands, they can talk to each other if they don't understand what you're looking for, and they very quickly have their um, questions about the assignments answered. In the online world where a student might be logging in at nine o'clock at night or four o'clock in the morning, they don't have anybody to ask. So what you want to do is make sure that all of your written assignments are very clear. So for example, that you've spelled out to the student, it's a, it's a two paragraph assignment times New Roman 12, one inch margins, etc., cetera, et cetera. In the examples that I'm sharing with you, I haven't done that because it takes up a lot of space on a slide. The fifth principle is to come up with variation in assignments. Um, students can get bored quickly online, just like they can in, in a traditional classroom. So come up with variation to keep them thinking and interested in what you're doing. 
So now you're probably wondering, that's all really theoretical, but what does that look like in the real world? Where do I start? I'm gonna take you back to what you learned when you were getting your teaching degree and when you spent time looking at curriculum development and lesson planning. Um, when I work with teachers and faculty who are building online classes and programs, I always insist on using backwards design principles. And that means we're gonna start with the outcomes, we're going to align it with an assignment, and then we'll talk about the materials. And in the online world, the last thing we do is we talk about what technology teaching tools we're going to be using. I know for many of us, when we first think we're teaching online, the first thing that comes to mind is what technology should I be using? So there's a tendency to start by thinking about the teaching tool first, but we really don't need to worry about that. The best teaching tools for engagement are the simplest and um, require the least amount of technology. So always start with your outcome and then think about the assignment, the materials you might be needing. And last of all, we can talk about the teaching tool because really that's the last thing you need to worry about. So I know you all know what your um, outcomes and objectives are. So let's talk about how do we develop um, assignments that um, afford student to student interaction, student to content interaction, and then student to teacher interaction. Bear in mind the five principles. Consider some of the following ways of structuring your assignments. Role playing, hypothetical situations and case studies, field projects, surveys and voting. And there are many more to pick from, but we'll focus on these four. I'm gonna start with virtual role playing. Here's an example. Ask your student to write about an experience from the perspective of an historical figure, an outside observer, a participant in an event, or even an element on the periodic table. The benefits of virtual role playing are that it gives the student the possibility to interact with each other and the content, as well as consider, apply, and apply other perspectives. So here are some examples. Here's what you might do in biology. And I'm not a biologist, so sorry about the simplicity of the assignment. Here's my assignment. You are a nonpolar gas molecule. Describe your journey as you move across a cell membrane. How do you respond when you encounter a protein and why? And after this, imagine you're a protein. Respond to the post of a molecule and describe what type of protein you are and how you react to the molecule. So you've got the student not just describing something from a scientific perspective, they're not just looking at it from an external observer point of view, they're actually a participant in the experience. And then they're responding um, to another student through a different lens. Here's an example of what you might do in a history class. You're a Native American who has just encountered the first pilgrims. Write a letter to them or a poem or a song explaining three of your cultural values. Now we all know that Native Americans didn't write letters to pilgrims, but this, this assignment gives the students the opportunity to write about their experience from the perspective of somebody other than themselves. So after the student has done this, their follow-up prompt is, from the perspective of a pilgrim, write back to another student and explain if you have similar or different values. So once again, the student is engaging with the content and then the student is engaging with another student. In English, here's an example, write a short mystery story. Do not give the story an ending. Write an ending to someone else's story and then explain why you chose this ending. Review the endings for your mystery story and explain if you thought they were effective. That's not really role playing, but it's an example of interaction. Second of all, consider um, assignments that call on hypothetical situations and case studies. 
So here's my example um, as a non-scientist. You're out with your best friend enjoying a nice day in space. You trip and fall into a black hole. Describe what happens to you. They've done this. You tell them the next step is you're out with your best friend enjoying a nice day in space. Your friend trips and falls into a black hole. How would you help him, her, or they out? Continuing, you've fallen into a black hole and your friend has the above plan for retrieving you. Do you think this plan will work? If not, suggest a better plan. So in this assignment, the student is engaging with the content. They're showing they know what happens with black holes, um, but they're responding to another peer and then they're re-responding to another peer. So it's very engaged on all levels. The third example of engaging is a field project. And this is a project that happens in virtual real time. In this case, the student is only going to be using the learning management system like Blackboard or Moodle or Canvas to report back and interact with each other. They're actually largely, <clears throat> excuse me, doing the work on their own. So here's the assignment of a field project. Students have been divided into three teams. Each student has been sent some lettuce and radish seeds. They've been instructed to research best methods for growing them, either inside in a pot or outside in the yard. Every day, the student will describe the growing conditions of their lettuces and radishes and post photos to their groups. Students will review the posted material and give feedback to their teammates. Students will be assessed based on the health of their plants and the quality of their feedback to each other. So this is a highly engaging um, assignment. Students are not just interacting with each other, they're working on a team project, they're building success, they're applying knowledge, not just to what they're doing themselves, but also showing how they can support their team members. Fourthly, think about how you can use surveys and voting in your class to um, engage students with each other and the material. So I found this really great example online and I'm going to use it here. On Monday, without discussion, write to the students. We'll vote on an issue a day for the next five days. Each morning, when you log into class, you'll use the voting button to place your vote on the issue described in the virtual voting box. And then during the week, don't remind students to vote. The following week or the end of the week, collate and post the voting results. Questions you might ask, who didn't vote and now wishes they had? Might the outcome have been different if everyone had voted? Why do you think more students vote on some days than others? And how could we apply this to the real world? So students are actually voting on issues. Um, you might come up with um, the vote. Do you want to have um, homework this Friday? And if students don't vote, the majority of the students don't vote, they all get homework on a Friday. So real, make it real and applicable for the student experience. So the best practice is that assignments in online that foster engagement are not just one way activities. You want to make sure there is a student response requirement and students don't have to respond to every student in the room, but just every week have them respond to one or two students. And as the term unfolds, require that students don't use the same students to interact with. So make sure that students interact with, with um, a variety of their classmates. Now we can come back to the question that you probably had in mind when you agreed to watch this session. What are the virtual tools that you should use to engage students? And here's what I'm gonna tell you, and here's what I tell anyone developing online courses and programs. Keep it simple. You don't need high tech to do this. The best tool that's available on every learning management system is the discussion forum or the discussion board. It can be used for nearly every single assignment for engagement. It's written, you can post photos, 
it's organized, students can respond to each other, it's easy for the instructor or the teacher to assess and grade. So make the discussion forum central to your engagement activities. You can also use blogs, live chats, live video like Zoom, and survey tools. Let's talk about the discussion forum in more detail because it's obviously the one that I think is the best tool available. The discussion forum is a tool that's used to replicate open synchronous discussion. Um, the expectation is that everyone reads and participates in the discussion forum. They don't have to read everyone's posts, but they have to read some posts. And the way you set it up is that you ask your question or you pose your, pose your situation. Maybe, maybe you've got um, a hypothetical situation. Write it up, post it in the discussion forum. The students will all log in, they'll read the assignment and every single student will respond to that prompt in writing. And then after they've done that, you're going to require the student, as you saw in my examples, to respond to each other. And you don't want to overwhelm them, so don't have them respond to four or five other students. Keep it very small. Have the students respond to one or two other students. What does the tool look like? What does the discussion tool look like? Um, I'm using Blackboard and Moodle for my examples. On the left, you can see um, a Blackboard screenshot and you can see in the dark blue margin, the tool is called the discussion board. In Moodle, on your right, I've taken a screenshot of an ad activity. This, this little box jumps up and halfway down, you can see it's called the forum. So the same tool, different learning management systems, slightly different name, but in all learning management systems, you're gonna find a discussion forum kind of tool. Make sure that you show your presence on the discussion forum. So after you've written your question, make sure you respond to every single student's post and then ask them a follow-up question and then follow up again. And you're gonna find that this takes the bulk of your work as a teacher, the managing the discussion forum and the grading and assessment. So get used to spending a lot of your time on the discussion forum. It can be draining until you get used to it. You're going to find over time, you're gonna have some really good responses that you can copy and paste um, time and time again, but get into the habit of acknowledging when a student has posted, um, respond to their work, ask them a follow-up question, and if they respond, which they should to you, follow up again and thank them. So you're gonna show your presence on the discussion forum. And again, think of the discussion forum as something similar to a live classroom where you're having a, um, a group session with your students or an engaged activity as a class as a whole. So I've just taken a screenshot of um, a discussion forum requirement. For each assignment that you post on the discussion forum, make sure your students know exactly what kind of criteria you want from them in response. So be clear in writing. So in this example, I've said the student post should, between, should be between 350 and 400 words in length. I don't want them to write a long book online. I don't have the time to read 25 responses that are three pages. But I want it to be like, a, like the feel of a, of a conversation. So I'm keeping my, um, my assignment length manageable to the student and manageable to myself. So your post should be between 350 to 400 words. You must have one direct quote. You can share a personal experience, but it must be relevant um, to the material, appropriate and not dominate the content of your post. So depending on what your assignment is, come up with a, a discussion forum requirements that match that. And then finally, I'm saying your student to student postings must be between 150 and 200 words. Responses such as good job, or you said it all, so I have nothing left to say and not acceptable. So make it clear what your expectations are for, for your discussion forum. So again, use the discussion forum as the primary means of engaging with your students. 
But you don't have to limit yourself to the discussion forum. You can use a blog or a wiki tool. And again, I've given an example from Blackboard Learning Management System and Moodle. You can also use live chat or Zoom, which you're probably doing already. Um, when you use live chat or Zoom, remember that a um, broadband might impact some students. They might not be able to participate or they might not have the self-confidence or the confidence in their ability to actually take over and talk um, through virtual chat technology. So the discussion forum is a good way to, to mitigate that. You can use voting tools. There's a free voting tool in Microsoft Office and Outlook but you can also find um, online a free voting tool called, called Poll Everywhere. And Zoom technology also has um, polling technology. So let's go back, kind of round up where we started. Um, I asked you to think about curriculum development and lesson planning. Always apply the backwards design principles. Think about your outcome first, and then your project or your assignment any materials you might need, and last of all, the teaching tool. But keep your teaching tools simple. You don't need high-tech tools for effective online interaction. The research about this is clear. The discussion forum is the best place to have engagement, student-to-student -student engagement, student-to-content engagement, and student-to-teacher engagement. So let's close by looking towards the future and a bit of a summary. Students learn best through their engagement in virtual settings. The best place for this is the discussion forum. Be creative. Experiment with your homeworks and assignments. If something goes wrong, if you try something and it's a complete flop, don't worry about it. See it as a learning opportunity. Try something else. And above all, have fun. Don't get too stressed about this. You know what to do. You know how to engage with your students. Go for it. You probably can't do much wrong. If you have any questions about learning to engage with your students in an online class, email me. I'm happy to help. I've got um, lots of experience working with distance education. I can probably help you come up with some assignments, some appropriate tools. I'm really, really happy to help. So I hope this session was meaningful to you and um, go for it. Be one of those teachers who embraces online learning, whether it's short term or long term. And um, if you have any questions, we are here for you. Thus ends my session.